Welcome back. This is video one of day two. What is it, the first today? Okay. And today's going to be kind of a mixed bag. We're going to finish up with what we were talking about um, on Tuesday, kind of talking about world energy and kind of just get a big picture look at how everyone's doing. And then we'll dive into climate change a little bit uh, just to get kind of a primer. I assume most of you have had a primer or more climate change. But then at the end, we're going to dive into the nitty-gritty of energy, talk about units and quantity, how we even conceptualize this stuff. So uh, first of all, did everyone get a chance to go on Moodle and check out Brad's kind of syllabus intro half hour daily? Okay. If you haven't, go do it. That will answer most of your questions. Are there other questions that I can answer from Tuesday or life? I was reading the book and I kind of had a question. I was like, I wasn't sure if it was like a typo or what. Okay. Uh, it was just, it's right here. It said like millions, like three times in a row. It's, uh, it's, like, it's showing a figure and it's like the world primary energy consumption in 2009 was an estimated 502 million joules. So yeah. Like joules is like, is like a unit. Pretty much, but why does it say millions? Because that's how many joules there is. We don't actually have a word. Yeah, yeah there's word. no word. <laughs> um, it would, the word we'll use today is exit, which means 10 to the 18 okay. million. Uh, so a million, million, million is 666, six, six, right? Yeah. Order of magnitude. Yeah. So 18. Okay, I wasn't sure. I was just like, yeah. So right at 1 with 18 zeros, that's a million, 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 or what we call an exit joule. So we'll talk about that towards the end of class. But thanks for bringing that up. Good primer. You guys see one in there where it had a thousand million. A thousand million? Yeah. One billion, right? One trillion. Yeah. Billion. Depends on how it's worded. But, well, that's why we're going to do this today, because we won't even need to worry about how many one million hundred thousand. We could just put a, a nice little prefix on it and make it really easy. Um, so we ended, let's see, this guy? so we ended last class sort of in this area we were talking about kind of how you can see our history kind of written into energy history. And you can see the Great Depression, you can see World War II, you can see the war between Iran and Iraq, the OPEC embargo, you can see, you would be able to see the Great Recession. Um, so anytime a graph comes up, you know, pay attention to where we are today. But then also look back and see if you can kind of read history. It's always a little bit helpful for remembering. Uh, we had a more detailed version given oil prices. When people complain about oil prices going up and down and they always blame the president. You know, there's, there's a lot going on around the world and we are not oil dependent. So if you want to know what oil prices are doing, maybe read the paper. More than anything. What? They can't. Oil prices. Yep. Two years ago, there was like hundred and thirty dollars per barrel. Now it's like I remember one forty seven. Yeah, I was out there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you know, um, and they'll go up again. Uh, uh, and they'll go slowly, down again. Very slowly. Yeah, yeah. So, they'll do. Oh, they'll yeah, do the same. This way. Oh. Um. <laughs> All right, and then we ended here. Global energy consumption. So darker countries consume more energy. So this could be electricity, oil any kind of fuel. And then lighter countries, obviously, not as much. So my question to start off today is, um, is this, does this seem fair, for one thing, to you all, because we live in the really, really dark country on the left. Uh, and this, is this a fair comparison of countries? Like when you look at this, do you think, oh, Saudi Arabia, US, Norway, you need to change your behavior? It's a fair representation of certain aspects of the country. Okay, like what? Like that we are the darker countries are obviously larger consumers. Right. Oh, and yeah. whether that's fair well, or high not. High population, I think, is related to it. Okay, so you're bringing in population. Yeah, I think that the United States is Yeah, population might. Like some of these other, like, well, poor countries. If you look at Iceland, though, mm -hmm. I mean, they're all geothermal. I was just there three months ago. They're all self-sufficient, 99% self-sufficient. For electricity, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not for oil, though. 
So you think it's unfair to color them dark and say? I would say so because they're self-sufficient for the most part. Other than oil. Well, I it's it's energy consumption, not necessarily like energy. So in some ways, I think it's Yeah, I mean, I can see your point on that, but when it's like free and it's internet, there's not, not there's not, no harm, no foul. I think. Okay. I'm glad you guys are sitting next to each other so you can continue. The what is the graph yeah. on Some <laughs> other <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay. So, yeah, there's, there's types of consumption. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Total. Total. Um, you're going to ask well, something? Well, I would say supply and demand has a big part in it. And uh, culturally, it's a weird that we've had a background of industrialization a lot sooner than the other countries uh, that you can see that are vastly more populated than we are, namely India and China. It's a matter of which place we've held on the planet, how long, and what has been you know, acquired as a value of the American culture. We value the ability to go back to our own home, have our own like square grid of energy usage that we pay for. It's, it's all provided, you know. And then those uh, lesser countries, I only say that technologically, uh, they just don't have the availability that we do. That's, you know, power lines <clears throat> stretching vast miles to supply people with power, even up in the great woods, you know? You don't see that in uh, lesser technologically advanced countries. Well, it's just the infrastructure isn't developed like we are. We're talking like population wise, there's more people in Montana than there is in Iceland. Right. So, really? Yeah. Wow. There's less, there's not a lot going on in Iceland. More people yeah, in Montana than in Alaska. Yeah. 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 Well, it seems like you've done it around Iceland. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think that if, if the United States was producing most of its own energy, which I'm not 100% sure about those percentages, then I think it, you know, it all kind of depends on the effect that it's having. But I think we outsourced a lot of that. And these these other countries that are like still developing countries, you know, like a lot of resources have been taken from those countries to supply its chain of power to the United States. So that's where I think it's not fair is because it, it you know, if everything is spread evenly, the only way for one party to have more is if it takes from the other party. Well, like know? Venezuela. So that's right. where they're a big producer too, and yet I don't, they're not as dark as everyone else. Yeah, I mean, they're up there for South America. Yeah. Yeah, not, not North. It's actually what's going South on America. with Venezuela. <laughs> don't do there. Right. So I don't, I don't want, there's no like grand conclusion for this map, except that you can't just look at a map and say, oh, <coughs> we can judge the US, we can judge Saudi Arabia. Because um, there is outsourcing, there is a population question. I could put up another map that's per capita. Um, or another map that's just total. And you should always question these maps when you see them. So then I pulled this one out because it's in your textbook. In chapter one, I think, right? pretty early on. And the textbook has a lot to say about it, but there's more questions to go on there. So that's something you'll talk about more in this class as you dive into individual fuel sources and consumption and production. So just keep this one in mind. For now, I want to this up. Um, I put this in perspective a little bit. Please. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're welcome. So, first step. So we're talking about um, talking about terrible handwriting. Energy consumption. For the U.S., per capita, do you know how we relate to the global average of energy consumption? First, yes, we're number one. In a big way, we're more than double the European Union and China and China and India. Wow. We're we're decreasing. Our per capita consumption is decreasing, as is Europe. But we're still. I mean, we started so high. That we consume it's like fifteen percent of global. Yeah, and then everything else comes down. I think it's a quarter. Really? 
which is about a quarter of yeah, okay. primary. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's insane. And we are decreasing, but obviously there's some room to get better. But in terms of global average per capita, do you know? Obviously we're more, but how much? Than the average? Three or four times? Yeah, we're about four times the global average. Sorry, that is a four. Um, if you take the lowest consuming country in the world, eight. Or just like Congo? Uh, they actually consume more. Mostly because they have hydroelectric resources um, and a lot of primary energy in terms of biomass. Haiti has no forest. There are a lot of interesting things in the Congo for white people to go set up things, not maybe. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, by the way, if you want a really interesting case example, look up the Grand Inga Dam. Right. Inga Dam. Grand Inga Dam. The dam that would be three times the size of three quarters in China. Which is currently the largest. Whole social justice thing involved there. But, yeah. Anyway, how much more do you think than Haiti? Take the most consuming and the least consuming. Well, like. Oh, then it has to be like triple. Triple, you think? Yeah. So you think three times eight? Well, if it's four times the global average, it must be way more. Mathematically, yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, eight times. Eight times? Ten times. No, oh, that's a mistake. Uh, seven times. Seven times. Something like that. Yeah. Never that I'd say, I'd say more than like 50. I'm going to say, yeah, at yeah, least it's 25. A hundred. Well, this is three. 25. Oh. So we use more in two days than they use in a year. Yeah. It would take 240 Haitians to equal your oh my personal God. energy consumption. That's crazy. And keep in mind, this these numbers include both direct and indirect consumption. Um, so directly, uh, if you have a watch, the battery in your watch is your consumer. <coughs> if you have a phone on right now, charge, that's direct. We're directly consuming the energy of the lights and the projector and the computer. But there's all kinds of other stuff. Like there's embodied energy in this building that went into pouring this concrete, um, went into extracting the copper for these electronics. All the infrastructure, the military. Like this is all infrastructure built around our society that we are indirectly responsible. So no matter what, Americans are just going to be more responsible for energy consumption than anyone else even just because of the direct. So you could go live naked in the woods and eat grass, and you would still be consuming more than <laughs> someone in China or Haiti, right? Just because of all this stuff that builds our society. So we're talking blood energy then. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're Depends on how you want to <laughs> We're responsible for <coughs> everybody as a whole, yeah. you know, so we're a collective even if we're... Well, even when we die, we have $10,000 funerals. Yeah, a lot of energy goes into that. Yeah, cemeteries take a lot of water. Yeah, and then our bodies don't even return to the earth. They just sit in the box. You can totally you get buried that. without coffins now, legally. Cool. Or you can get buried in a wicker coffin. That's why it's very cool. Oh, what a great one. Oh, what a great one. They have trees above you. Trees above you, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's not get too far down this road. Yeah. That's good. That is a great question. <laughs> if you want to be really sustainable, die is probably. Best thing. The best thing you can do, but that's how you die back. So, Save the earth, kill yourself. <laughs> Everyone online, you didn't hear that. It's a happy day. Look outside. Um, anyway, so that's not that's dark. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. Yeah. It's just life. It's okay. Well, it's a good thing I'm not ten years old. Um, but we're talking about consumption, so you can say a lot of things about consumption: your lifestyle, the society, the but economically, consumption, um, how would you tie consumption into something like that? What would be a good analogy for that? You, there's a certain amount of energy consumed to produce the things you buy. Okay, yeah. It's kind of embodied energy in your lifestyle. 
demand equals consumption. Okay, so we got demand. Um, the term that I would apply to this is standard of living. So when, when we look at these consumption graphs, <coughs> the countries that were darker tend to be higher standard. Standard. Not to be confused with quality of life. The yes, happiest you have, countries. You'd have more freedom, too. Yeah. So totally it depends on what you consume and why you consume. We can get in our car and drive across the country and not, there's not a lot of countries that you can do that in. I'd say um, availability of resources. So like you're saying, a higher standard of living is, you know, directly tied to like what people to culture. So I think that if you don't have something available to consume, then obviously you're going to have consumption. So because we're like in a country where that there's a lot of goods produced, then it's easier for us. So you're, you're tying this into production as well. Yeah, definitely. So when it comes to production, obviously, this can lead to that. But there are countries that produce and don't consume. Because mm, they ship it away to us. Yeah. <laughs> Outsourcing, that's another yeah. thing. Yeah. To say they ship it away may be, might be a generous term. Uh, yeah, maybe. We ship it to us. Yeah, we take it away. <laughs> um, can anyone name a country that might get this? China. China. <laughs> China. I mean, China does consume a lot. They're pretty happy that it's not going on. Yeah. Taiwan, yeah. Yeah, uh, India's a big one. India produces a lot of stuff. They have a lot of reserves. Not as oh, much as we oh, do. So a country that produces Are you talking about energy? Most of it out. Oh, oh right. Mexico. Are you talking about Mexico. energy or are you talking about uh, consumer goods? Um, they're tied together, but let's focus on energy. Okay. okay. So fuels. Bangladesh. Bangladesh. No. Yeah, maybe. Middle okay. East. They actually consume quite a bit of their own. They also sell quite a bit. They also sell quite a bit. They can afford to. Where does quinoa come from? Quinoa? That's yeah. South America. Yeah. You can tweet stuff. Yeah, quinoa is South America. Okay, yeah. So, South America then. <laughs> yeah. Um, but here's, think of a country like, um, I was going to take two opposite examples. There's a country like uh, Korea, South Korea, Republic. Doesn't have any fossil fuel reserves of its own. And imports like crazy. So all of its oil comes from the Middle East, all of its gas comes from Russia, all of its coal comes from Russia. They're desperate for their own energy resources and they don't have it. So they consume a lot and they produce very little. Opposite end of the spectrum, you might consider Angola. How does, well, how does like South Korea get all like Korea allowed to? I think North Korea has a say. Well, yeah, but isn't like, I don't know. Seems like it would have to go through North Korea at some point to get to some. Well, that's the problem. North, North Korea, Korea wants to have a say in it, but. Huh? South Korea on the water, so does that mean it has part of it? Yeah. South Korea's on the water. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah true. Yeah. China has a major say in all of it, don't they? China does have a say, mostly in North Korea. Um, but the opposite of the spectrum, you might consider Angola, which has a lot of oil and is mostly taken over by colonial powers. So BP or other oil companies might come in, kind of settle camp, drill the oil, ship it out. So Angola produces a lot and consumes almost a lot. Where's Angola? Southern. 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 Uh, but since we're talking about production, you might tie this into revenue. You know, if, you, if you're in Korea and you can't produce much, you spend a lot of your GDP, a lot of your budget on importing food. Um, if you're Angola, or the elite few in Angola who run this, you get a lot of money without having to consume much. So it's kind of this production um, consumption thing going on. Uh, so you might tie this, I think someone mentioned independence. This is a big political talking point right now. The U.S. wants to become energy independent. And every political player wants to become energy independent. So conservatives want to, liberals want to, kind of universal thing. Split on the top and they want to take. Exactly, yeah. Like, do we just drill our own? <laughs> <laughs> but this, this isn't just an economic thing. This is 
This is everything. I mean, think about the efforts we go to to get forth for our country. Like, this is a global, energy defense is a global issue, no matter whose problem it is to begin with. going back and forth on this. You've heard the term peak oil? <coughs> yep. Yeah. What does that refer to? Burn out. <laughs> yeah, so basically... Yeah, that's really it's simple, like the maximum limit of like the bell curve. Yeah, where it's like, like we we're hit, making the maximum and then we're going to start declining. And then like, it's just going to decline from there on. Right, so if this is oil production over time, you know, we started with very little. At some point, we will peak in how much we can draw from our reserves, and it'll just decline. So that's what's referred to as peak oil. That's only considering the values that are already found, not the ones that they have. Right, so now you're talking about reserves. So if you want to talk about consumption, you have to talk about production. If you want to talk about production, you have to talk about reserves. Um, so when we talk about things like solar, wind, and hydro, we don't mention reserves. Those are renewable. Anytime you mention the word reserves, it is inherently non-renewable. So this, of course, is oil, gas, coal. Um, there are two different kinds of reserves, and I'm not sure this is something you need to know for this class, but there's just reserves, and then there's proved reserves. So. I'm sure you can speak to this. Uh, right, there's outproof reserves that, uh, you know, like Alaska, the pipeline up there, they're just off of one reserve up there that they've, you know, that they've tapped into. They have another one that they haven't even started to tap into that's called Pit 4. It's five times the size of the one that's found. You know, they, there's a lot of stuff that isn't above board. Right. Yeah, yeah think about. Um, so I'll just define these quickly. A, a reserve is just a fuel that exists. So we have, we, everyone has reserves somewhere. Proved reserves is a reserve that you know you can access. So either you have the technology, not either, you have the technology and you have the money. And it's economically viable to pull it out and sell it. That would be a proved reserve. So when oil prices go down, our proved reserves go down. Because now the oil companies are making less money, it's less economically viable for them to go to the harder places to drill. When oil prices go up, our proved reserves go up, and we can access more hard-to-reach places. That's the money's there. That's the money's there. So a great example of this is tar sands. Everyone's heard of tar sands? Oh, yeah. Uh, or they're all over Canada. Oh, yeah. Dakota. Oh, there's some in Utah as well. Yeah, Utah, Bakken, and then Alberta okay. is the tar sands cap. Got it. It's recent. Um, so, go back 20 years, 10 years, 20 years. Tar sands is a ridiculous idea. It's like, why would you ever go to all the trouble and spend all the money to try and pull oil out of sands buried underground? It's way too expensive. You can't make revenue doing that. Once oil prices go up, you have more revenue. It's more viable to go get those tar sands. It makes more sense. So. The reason tar sands are such a hot button issue is that they're constantly kind of popping up and down between viability and non viability. So, the pipeline. You remember the Keystone cell mm -hmm. pipeline? Yeah. So, the pipeline makes it cheap to transport oil, which makes it viable to pull tar sands. No pipeline, it's more expensive to transport oil, tar sands isn't viable. So, that's why the pipeline was a big deal. Like, if you don't have the pipeline, they don't take. Mm -hmm. You know, theoretically. Yeah. That's they cool. So this is where reserves and proved reserves come into play. Uh, economically, the way we tend to talk about this is something called the reserves to production ratio. I know it sounds very boring. The RPR. This is how we kind of in a simplistic way determine how much longer we have to extract a resource. So when we talk about peak oil, that means someone has calculated the RPR, the reserve production ratio, of oil and has determined that we are nearing the end 
of our time with this research. So this we've already talked about. Reserve is exactly what it sounds like. It's all like carbon credits and And then production. Production can sound a bit like a misnomer. It's just how much uh, you can recover. Like we say, oil recovery or gas extraction. Just how much of the resource you pull into your own stock. And it is on a time basis. So you have higher production if you can pull 100 tons out in a year versus if you pull 100 tons out in 10 years. So this is going back to this idea of different countries having different incentives, different powers, um, different kind of future prospects. So if you think about the units here, so reserve to production ratio. So reserve in the numerator, production the denominator. If you have low reserves and high production, what does that mean for how much time you have left? Very short. Less. Very short, yeah. So a low RPR is bad if your economy is based on this resource. If you have a ton of resource and you're only pulling out a little bit, high RPR, good for you. Probably good for the client. Can I close this for a second? Okay. So we'll be, this is going to be like high school again, good little examples. So let's say you have, you want to do coal or gas? Gas. 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 All right. Say you have 40,000 um, trillion cubic feet, TCF. So a cubic foot is a basketball. Um, so you have a trillion of these of gas. And you pull out a thousand trillion cubic feet of So let's say you're a rancher somewhere, gas company has a bunch of wells on your land. Uh, that's how many exist, 40,000, and they're pulling out a thousand every year. So what's your Reserve to production. 40. 40, yeah. So you do, you just divide these. So reserve on top, production on the bottom. Careful with the units. We so said 40, 41. 41? 40 divided by 1. So you said. So, 40 years now? 40 years, yeah. Does everyone understand how unit cancellation works? Essentially, TCF on top. Cost cancel out. Yeah, so. Yeah, so trillion cubic feet, trillion cubic feet. Second denominator becomes numerator. So 40 years. So 40, what are 40 years of life? Right, that's the RPR. 40 years of reserve. Maybe in 40 years, what happened? Yeah. You're right. So it's a very simple concept, right? <coughs> Not anything <coughs> super useful. Like, you get like a combined RPR and oil and you're that. You could do it, but coal and oil are used for very different things. Yeah. Coal is almost primarily electricity, oil is almost primarily transportation. Um, so yeah, you could do a combined RPR. You'd have to find a unit that works for all three fossil fuels. I'm sure there's a use for it. I can't think of one on the top. Like, of and like some are probably like some areas. Are like right. Like right now, oil, I think the U.S. in general values oil over coal yeah. at the moment. Just economically, not yeah. necessarily ethically. Um, so yeah, the RPR of oil is going to matter. 
but that doesn't change the numbers. Yeah. The only thing that changes the numbers is if we discover more, or we're like we have more proof reserves, or if we increase or decrease our rate of production. Does anyone have a question about this? I think it's pretty simple, but it's something that's going to come up over and over as you talk about fossil fuels, especially. So I will be back to grab. And maybe this is a good place to stop the video, and then we'll come back. So farewell, people in the ether somewhere. <laughs>